So I want to uh, speak to you this morning about faith journey. Who of you have been on a journey of faith at times? Maybe right now, or you've been on one recently or in the past that uh, the Lord has brought you through just different phases of I believe, I don't believe, I'm not sure if I believe, up and down we go, right? So I want to talk to you about how we get on those faith journeys. In life, it just does provide us with many opportunities to stretch and grow our faith, doesn't it? Life just does that. And, you know, what's interesting is when we go through life th things and challenge, challenges, it often reveals what's on the inside of us. And sometimes it can be good to see what's in there, and sometimes it can be discouraging to see what's in there, and sometimes it can be a little frightful to see what's in there. It's like, oh, I didn't know that was still there. Maybe an attitude or the way I relate to something or the way I respond to something when something happens to me. So allow the Lord this morning uh, <clears throat> to speak to you about those things, and I'd like to encourage you to take a minute to think about a challenge that the Lord is using maybe right now to stretch you, or he used recently to stretch you, or maybe something you think is about to come that he wants to use to stretch you. Just spend the time during this message to think about those. For some of you, it may be so severe that you're literally wondering whether it's about to wreck your faith. If you're in that space this morning, I want to encourage you that you're in the right place. Not because you're listening to me, but because you're in a place where God himself, where the Bible is clear that where two or three are gathered in, together in his name, he is there in the midst. The Bible is also very clear that if you're, if you're saved, if you're born again, if you've asked Jesus to save you of your sins, that his Holy Spirit resides in you. But there's something important about being together and around people who are like believers. So you're in the right place this morning if you're at that spot where maybe you're struggling with something so severe that you really feel like it's about to wreck your faith entirely. And even if you're not at that extreme place, even if you're growing, even if things are good, God still wants to teach us something about faith as he's been doing with me recently, and I want to share with you some of those things. This message, as I said, is about a journey. It's not about a one, th one time in place. It's not about something that happens and that's it. Literally, this life of walking with the Lord is a journey. Is a journey. Let's look at uh, Malachi chapter 4, starting at verse 4. One of the first things that we need to do when we're on our journey of faith is to remember. What do I mean by that? Well, let me read this scripture to you, and then I'll go through that a little bit. Matthew, I'm sorry, Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 says, Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant. All the decrees and regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. Let me read, let me read that again to you. He sa it says, Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant. All the decrees and regulations I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. So what's the context of this scripture? It's important, by the way, when you're reading the scriptures, when you're reading the word of God, I would encourage you to get in a habit of studying it. Understand the context. There's lots of tools out there to do that. But the context of this scripture, this was given at a time where there would be 400 years with no prophetic voice. There'd be no prophetic voice. So remember, we're in the time of the New Testament now where after the day of Pentecost and, and Jesus went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit, by his Holy Spirit, he speaks to us individually regularly, right? In the Old Testament, before the Holy Spirit was poured out, he spoke to people through prophets. Not the prophecy has ended today, but he spoke through the prophets, specifically back then. So they're about to go into, Israel's about to go into, and the people are about to go into 400 years. Think of how many generations that is without a specific word from God. 400 years. What is that? Three, four, depending upon how long people live, five generations? That's a long time. That's a long time. But what are they told to do? They're told to remember. So what's the application for us today? Well, here's what I believe the Lord would want me to share with you, and that is when you think God is silent, and maybe he really is silent because sometimes he is not speaking with 100% clarity to us, at least in a way we can hear him and understand it. 
Let me put it that way. When he is silent or we think he is silent, we need to remember a few things. We need to remember, one, what is it that he's done for us in the past? Why is that important? Because when we can remember what he has done for us in the past, it gives us encouragement to realize that, what? He can do something similar for us again or in the future. Maybe not exactly the same, but if we can't remember what God has done for us in the past, it can be very hard for us to be encouraged in a time of discouragement or in a time of silence that God is still on his throne and he can do for us again what he has done for us before. Why? Because the Bible says he's the same yesterday, he's the same right now, and he'll be the same in the future. He does not change. The other thing as far as remembering is remembering what he has promised to do in our future. For some of you, God has made a promise to you where he has said there is something coming that he has promised you to do in your future. And maybe you have lacked faith or you have given up on that promise and you're not sure of whether that's going to be fulfilled or not. But we need to remember what those things are, what he has said. So what has he already brought you out of? That's a great thing to remember. For some of us, for some of you, it's been the very pit of hell he's brought you out of. Maybe for some of you, when you came to salvation, you didn't experience in your life things that you would describe as coming out of the very pit of hell. Although I will tell you that no matter what you think, before we came to the Lord and without him, we were in the pit of hell. <laughs> Maybe we made different choices than other people, but it doesn't change the fact that we all need a Savior. We all need somebody, and that somebody is Jesus, who can take us out of the pit of hell and set our feet on a rock so that we can serve him appropriately the days of our lives and into eternity. Another thing to remember is what has he already rescued you from? What has he already provided to you in the past? Now, we think of provision. You think, oh, money. What has he given me for money? Yeah, that's a provision. But maybe through someone else, he, he gave you encouragement. Maybe through someone else, he actually provided something material for you. It's not always about money, is it? But always remember and think about, Lord, what, remind me, what have you already provided to me in the past? And where have you seen him already involved in your situations and actually changing them? Who of you have actually can think of an example where God has actually come into a situation you're in the middle of and changed it? About 50%? Ooh, that's it? Just 50% of you? Let me try again. Don't lie. I don't want you to lie to me. We're less than 50% now. Okay, I'm not going to ask the question one more time. But I think for all of us that have walked with the Lord, we have seen him involved in our situations. We have a ton we can praise God for, do we not? It does not matter what situation we're in. When we're on this faith journey, there is always something to praise God for. We have a ton that we can praise the Lord for. Whether, it's, whether you're in a bad spot or you're in a good spot, never forget the principle of praise and worship. Always remember that. The other place for him to look, to look for God when you think is silent is in here. Whether you use this, which is probably now considered old school, on, the written, on a written piece of paper, or you use it electronically, we need to remember the written word of God. Why? Remember why this was written and how this was written. This book is not a history book, though it has a lot of history in it. This book was written by prophets and people who heard from the throne of God and recorded on these pages what it is that God wanted them to record so that all generations to come forever then and forever in the future had something to refer back to. This is our plumb line. If you think you've got a word from God and it violates this, that is not a word of, from God. Be very careful. I felt I needed to share that in the first service, and I feel like I need to share that now. Be very careful. If you think you have, I'm going to say it one more time. If you think you get a word from God or someone comes to you and tells you, I believe God has said this, and it violates this, very simple, that is not a word from God. But when you think God is silent, or if he is silent, and you're not hearing him, you can hear him through the pages of this word. Why? Because there are things that he's already spoken to us. He has already spoken to us in this word. 
Yes, he continues to speak to us today by his spirit. We don't rely on prophets anymore to come to us with words from him. We have this, and we have his Holy Spirit. But when you cannot hear him, read this. Read this anyway, even if you think you are hearing him. Because this keeps us on the straight and narrow. I'm sure many of you, like me, have read this word many times. And you read the passage that you've, re you've read thousands of times, maybe. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but whatever. And you read that, and all of a sudden, you see something there that you never saw before. Or see, you see a word there, and you go to a Bible dictionary, and you decide for the first time, you look that word up in the Greek or the Hebrew, depending upon which testament it's in, and you look that up like, oh, that has a whole lot of different meaning than I originally thought that it had. Or it adds something that you never knew. Learn to study the Word of God. It's important. You don't have to be a scholar, but dig in. There are simple things that we can all do to understand the Word better. You may read a scripture again that you've read many times, and all of a sudden there's an application in there that God has never used and shown you before because there's an application that's needed for you right then in the moment. That is another way, reason to be in the Word of God. Yes, God will use a spoken word into your spirit directly. Yes, God will use prophetic voices and people who are using the gifts of the spirit to speak to you as well. We need to listen to them as well. But I will also tell you another caution. And I don't know why God has me on this, but I feel like I need to stay here for a minute more. Just because somebody comes up to you and says, I have a word of God for you, it's your responsibility to discern it and decide if it's truly the word or not. As I said, it should not violate the word of God, number one. But number two, even if it doesn't violate the word of God, still might not mean it's a word of God for you. Be careful if you say, thus saith the Lord. Be careful as you receive it. Yes, flow in the spiritual gifts. Absolutely. I will tell you as you move in the spiritual gifts, I hate to tell you this, this is not a secret, but I'm going to give you a secret. You'll make mistakes. Shh. It will happen. I've made mistakes. But I've also had people that have, I've been corrected by and been gracious about it. But it's up to us, when a word is given, to discern it. Go seek counsel, too. If you've gotten a word and you're not sure, go to a godly person and seek counsel. Okay. I can get off that now. We don't always have clarity, do we, when God speaks to us? We just don't. It's a fact. When God is speaking to us, we don't always understand the end from the beginning. You may know that you have a promise and you see that light at the proverbial end of that tunnel, but guess what? Sometimes that tunnel's not straight, is it? Sometimes it's a road that does this and goes like that, and we can't see how we're going to get there. But that doesn't mean that that promise is not true in any event. I was thinking during worship, because I'm wearing glasses today, as you can tell, and I was wearing my, my face covering, and I was thinking, like, you know, it's an awful lot like that. I could still see, but because my glasses were fogging, I couldn't see 100% with clarity. I had to struggle a little bit to see. It's a little bit like that sometimes with God, isn't it? You can see but it's a little bit unclear at times. And that's okay. That's what faith is about. So let's talk a little bit about gratefulness and taking action. I just want to give you a couple of quotes. Mark, you're probably hating me right now, right? Because I have no idea where the slides are versus what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> so learn to be grateful. Rick Warren is somebody you're probably familiar with. And I heard these quotes on a Christian streaming service. And it stuck with me. I really like this. Gratefulness. So Thanking God for what he has already done is gratefulness. Think about that. Not terribly profound, but it makes a ton of sense. Thanking God for what he's already done is gratefulness. Thanking God for what he has promised to do is what? It's faith. Thanking God for what he's already done is gratefulness. So we've got a lot to be grateful for, as I've already said. But in a faith journey, thanking him for what he has promised to do is faith. God has made promises to us. Now, what about taking action? Because we need to activate faith. He also said at a different time, we need to activate our faith. Take action as if he's already given the answer. Take action as if he's already given the answer. So learn to take action. 
That is very different than sitting and doing nothing, even if you have a word of the Lord. Okay? That's very different. Let's look at the principle of planting for a minute. John chapter 12, verse 24. John chapter 12, verse 24. It says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, what's the context here? It's important always when you're reading scriptures, as I said, to understand context. The context here is this is not long before Jesus' death. And he's referring to the necessity of his death so that he might be glorified, and then that work of the cross in the empty tomb would obviously produce much fruit and many seeds for the rest of eternity. That's the context here in what he's talking about. But I believe there's application for us here too. And that is we have to die to ourselves first, and we also have to learn to plant seeds. In other words, we have to activate, we have to do stuff to activate our faith. As Rick Warren said, we need to activate our faith and act as if he has already given us the answer. Now, if we don't ever plant the seed, right? So what does the scripture say? Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. Well, if you have a packet of seeds, those of you that do any kind of gardening, and I don't, but if you have a packet of seeds and you don't ever do anything with those seeds, do you ever get any fruit? Does it ever produce any other seeds? No. The seeds stay in the packet or it just doesn't do anything even if it's outside the packet. So you have to plant the seed. So what, die, what needs to die in us? That's the first question we need to ask ourselves. And secondly, what needs to be planted and given to him so that there's greater production in our lives? Two things to encourage you to talk about, to think about. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6. Related to this topic. He says, Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let your hands not be idle, for you do not know what will succeed, whether this or that, or whether bo both will do equally well. Sow your seed in the morning. Plant the seed. Take action. Do stuff. Plant the seed. Sow your seed in the morning. But at the evening, when the rest of the day is coming, as you're still going through your day, as you're toward the end of your day, let your hands not be idle. That's action. Do things. Why? Because you don't know what will succeed, whether this or that. So when you're planting seed, you don't always know what the fruit will be. You don't always know what the next thing's going to come. You don't always know what the result will be of faithfully planting some seed in the ground. Especially when you're walking in the areas that God has called you to walk in. Or whether both would do equally well. We don't necessarily know the outcome of our planting. We don't know if it's going to be a good crop. We don't know whether it's going to be a bad crop. We don't know if we'll get a crop at all but we have to plant. I've watched my parents plant gardens over the years. I remember my grandmother, till almost the day she passed away, she still had a garden, at up to 94, 95 years old. And the one thing I know from watching them plant gardens is that every year they plant, they prepare the soil the same way. They fertilize it the same way, for the most part. They plant a very similar crop of vegetables. Maybe not exactly the same, but very, very similar. Some years, though, they'll get a bountiful harvest, of, and I always think of green peppers, but they'll get a bountiful harvest of peppers. In other years, maybe the plants come up, but they get hardly anything. And there's not always an answer. The, the conditions just weren't right for some reason. And I thought that really fit this scripture well because maybe the preparation and the activation of faith is exactly the same and doing all of the same things. But the crops, as the scripture says, you don't know what it's going to be in the end. 
But it doesn't tell us to not plant. It says to plant, and then it says to do things in the evening because we don't know what the crop or the outcome will be. It's important, though, that we take the right action and not be foolish. There's a scriptural principle of counting the cost, isn't there? So I'm not giving you, teaching you this to give you license to go off and do anything you think you should do and call it faith. People do crazy things and call it faith. <laughs> I don't, I'm live, so I'll be careful what I say. I'll just use the word foolish. You might call it faith, it might be foolish. So be careful. Count the cost, understand. But don't be paralyzed to the point where you do nothing. The key is to act based on the word that we have from the Lord. Now, I do not have a green thumb. For those of you who know me, you know that to be true. But I was thinking about planting grass. So if I go out in my yard and I have a place that needs to be this bare and needs some grass, when I do the right thing and I bring in maybe some topsoil and I rake it off and I loosen it so that the grass seed can take root and, you know, but I'm one of these guys that I like to dig, dig into the grass, the bag of grass seed and I like to just put as much as that baby will hold because I figure the more the better, right? Well, grass doesn't all, it doesn't all germinate. And it's probably good the way I plant it, because if it did, I wouldn't be able to get, you know, a, a farm tractor with a blade through it, because it would be so thick. But the one thing I have learned is that times I'm lazy, though. I don't know if you've ever done this. I won't ask you if you've ever done this, but I've done this plenty of times, where I'll be out in the middle of my yard, and I'll be like, oh, there's a little bare patch there, and I'll just go get some grass. I'm like, nah, pew, just throw it on there. Something will come up. What do you think comes up? Nothing. Now, the birds like it because they get some free grass seed. So the point is, is that we can be a little bit lazy in our activity, too, and call it faith when that's not really what it is. Do what the Lord wants you to do in the timing that the Lord wants you to do it in, and work heartily as unto him, as, as the Scripture says. One of the first times I ever heard God's voice speak to me was in high school that I really remember him speaking to me. And I know for some of you, when I'm about to tell you this story, you'll be thinking, oh, another sports glory day story. But I'm going to share it with you anyway, because I love sports, for those of you who know me. So in my senior year, we played a uh, tournament semifinal game against a team, uh, Oxbow, actually. We went to their field. There is no way we should have beat them at all. No way. They were so good, and we were good, but we were not that good. In fact, they were so good, they had a transfer student from the former Yugoslavia that that day scored, I think it was his 42nd and 43rd goal of the year against us that day. And for context, I think we played about, I don't know, maybe 14 games or so a year. So if you do the math, that's a lot. He was very good. In fact, they were so good that I played defense. They were so good that you could watch the play come down, come down the field at us. And you could see, you know, they'd have the ball, and here they'd come, and they'd pass it off to the wing, and then they'd pass it back to him in the middle, and then he'd take a shot. And then I would turn around and watch my goalie make a tremendous save because that's the only way that we survived was because our goalie played so well that day. That and we might have knocked this kid around a few times, bloodied him just a little bit. But anyway, that's, that's a different message for a different day. So the fact of the matter is God something, said something to me very simple that day, and he said, you're going to win. We, we were behind at halftime 2-0, to zero, but we won the game. So why am I boring you with this story? Well, here's why I'm boring you with this story. Because what I believe, why I believe the Lord reminded me of this for this message is because we still could have made a choice. I could have made a personal choice, even though I had the word of the Lord there that, and I know today it was still God's word, that we are going to win. We could have chosen to either A, stop playing and walk off the field, well, that's crazy. What would have happened then? We would have forfeited and lost. We could have, B, not played as hard, not continued to work as hard, not to continue to try to do the important things we needed to do, and we would have lost. So we still had to, still had to work and work hard and play hard and activate in order to see, and nobody else knew I had that word of the Lord but me, but still, if we didn't do those things, God's word would not have come to fruition. If you received a prophecy, someone taught me this once. 
If you get a prophetic word over you, and it might be exactly the word God has for you, but if you either A, set it aside, or B, let your life get derailed and don't follow through on the things God has for you, guess what might happen with that prophetic word? It may not come to fruition. Does that mean God didn't speak truth? It does not. But we have to participate in those things to see those things come to, come to pass. We not long ago put our house on the market, and um, thankfully it finally, uh, we finally closed on it this past Friday, and, which was great for us. And those of you that know me, we did things a little bit backwards. Normally, I would have preferred to sell our house, then go buy a house, because I'm just conservative that way. Well, <clears throat> we did it in opposite. We bought a house, then we put our house on the market, and went the other way. We thought, ah, this market, it's humming, it's hot. It, our house will sell like that. Friends and family are like, your house is so nice. It's going to sell really quickly. And people, people up the street and behind us, houses were going, going, going. We couldn't get a showing hardly to save our lives. We're like, what is going on? Well, we had prayed at the very beginning a very simple prayer, but Lord, send us the person you want to buy our house. Guess how many offers we got? One. In a market where things were really humming along and going very, going very well, but seemingly not for us. Secondly, I was in a time of prayer between service, and Cindy Stevens prayed that we would get the price that God wanted us to get. I'm like, oh, thank you because I wanted above market price. <laughs> but that was exactly the right prayer to pray. What do you want, Lord? As Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And we got a price that was very favorable in the end. But the point is, we had to take steps to prepare because until we made a decision that, you know what, as of this date, we are going to move. We are going to prepare and start doing things to move into the new house. When we started doing that and took active steps of faith, because we did feel we had the word of the Lord, showing started happening, and we finally got that offer. So again, when you're activating your faith, when you are taking steps that's when you should, will be able to see and sometimes start seeing God move on your behalf. Just a couple of things about God ordering our steps, and if the worship team could come back, please. I just want to share these with you to take these with you. God has promised that he will order our steps. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. It says, whether you turn to the right or you turn to the left, your eyes, your, your, eyes, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whether you turn to the right or you turn to the left, you will hear the voice of God saying behind you, this is the way, walk in it. If you feel that God is silent and you're struggling to hear him, hold on to that verse this morning. Know that you will hear him say, this is the way, now walk in it. Again, you will not see clearly all the way to the end maybe, but he will and wants to order your steps. More proof. Psalm 20, uh, 37, verse 23 says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. It's a promise. He will direct your steps. He delights in every detail of your lives. Proverbs 20, verse 24 says, The Lord directs our steps. And I like this part, except I don't like this part. But it's appropriate for this morning. So why try to understand everything? The Lord directs our steps, so why try to understand everything along the way? Newsflash, we are not going to understand everything along the way. We're just not. Some of you are questioning why are you in the situation you're in, wondering why you're at where you're at. Some of you are in a really good place and you're still maybe saying, ah, there's something I just don't get. We don't always have to be in a terrible place for this scripture to be true for us. But know that he directs your steps. And don't try to be like me and try to understand everything along the way because you can't. I'm pretty analytical. I like to know why. Here's what I will tell you, though. Remember what I talked to you about before about remembering? 
when you look back, you might not have 100% of the answers, but you'll have a lot more of them once you come through it, once you go on that journey of faith and you come through the other side. I don't know about you, but I can look back and I can see things that I now look back and say, oh, all right, I get it, a little bit of it. Maybe I don't understand all of why, but I see what he was trying to do in me and I see what the result of it is. And it helps me not question quite so much. The next time, Max Lucado talked on a streaming service I was listening to about anxiety. And I'm somebody that can very quickly get to a place of being a bit anxious. Uh, if I don't get my own way, or if something doesn't work out exactly like I think, or everything seemingly is going along swimmingly, and all of a sudden something just gets tweaked just a touch, you know, my blood pressure goes up, my face gets red, I start worrying, start figuring out what can I do to change this. Sometimes I don't go to the very first place I should go to, which is, Lord, what are you trying to say? Some of you this morning, I believe, need to say, Lord, what are you trying to say? What do you say, Lord? What do you say? But Max Licato was talking about anxiety, and he said, how if we have it, it means really that we're human. Just because we're a Christian doesn't mean that we won't battle this at times. He said, you're not stupid. You're not emotionally underdeveloped. You're not immature. Parents didn't fail you. You didn't fail your parents. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Christians battle anxiety. And he pointed out a really great example, and that was Jesus. What better example is there, is there than that? Where Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he suffered a lot of anxiety that, then, didn't he? To the point of struggling, and I know there was a lot going on, I'm sure, with the weight of what was coming with the cross and the weight of all of humanity's th sins. Think about that. It's bad enough to have the weight of our own. Imagine having the weight of all of humanity's <laughs> sins upon you. And remember, he was 100% man, too. But he was able to fight through it and say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, even after he asked God his Father to take the cup of suffering from him. He pushed through it. And we can push through it, too, and say the same thing. And the last thing I liked what he said, he said, anxiety comes with life, but it doesn't have to dominate your life. That's a big difference, right? Anxiety does not have to dominate my life. It might dominate a moment. It might dominate a week. It might dominate a month. But it doesn't have to dominate my life in total. Why? Because I'm a child of God. I'm a child of the King of Kings. I can truly have peace that passes understanding or peace that does not make any sense in the middle of a trial. Peace that comes on a journey of faith that you might be in. So if you're facing anxiety this morning, I want to encourage you to just surrender it to the Lord. There's a great song that I really love worshiping to, and probably many of you have heard it. It's called Graves in the Gardens by Elevation Worship. And it says that there's nothing better than you. I want to read you some of these lyrics. There's nothing better than you. Talking about the Lord, obviously. And I love the exchanges they talk about in the song. It says, you turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. He's the only one that can. You know, as you're walking up to that red, proverbial red sea in your life, he's the only one that can take a sea, think about that, and turn it into a highway. So not only can we walk through that with a wall of water on all sides, but that the ground is also dry so we actually can walk through it. He's the only one that can. You know, Moses with the Israelites, God called him to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt, their place of physical bondage. But if we relate that to us, that's also a place of spiritual bondage, right? Moses was called to bring the people out of Egypt. Now, 
we know the Israelites were a little bit like us, if we're honest. They had grumbled. They complained. They didn't have much faith. They didn't really trust God. But you know what they had to do in order to come out of Egypt? They had to walk out of Egypt. They had to activate something and follow Moses. They actually had to walk out of Egypt to activate their faith and actually move and do something. And I think that that's what God is saying to us this morning, at least in part, is, again, at, learn to activate our faith. Learn to do something. Psalm 144, 15, the second half of the verse says, Joyful, or another word there is happy. Happy indeed are those whose God is the Lord. And that word Lord very simply means it's the proper name of the one true God. Happy indeed are those whose God is the one true God. So let's trade our morning to dancing. For some of you, there's some shame, I believe, in this place, too. Let's turn your shame into glory. Let's let God take your shame and remove it and turn it into glory. Let's get God take some of your lack of faith this morning and revive it and turn it into active, alive faith that is once again ready to move on with him despite maybe what you're dealing with this morning. Let's pray. I don't know all of you this morning. If you could be in an, pray with me and just be in an attitude of prayer. I want to invite you this morning, uh, if, if anyone is here that has never given their life to Christ, has never allowed him to be their savior, to take all of the things they've ever done wrong and ever would do wrong again and take them upon himself. Because remember, all of us need a savior for now, but also to enter into heaven one day. His word is very clear on that. It's not only an invitation for salvation, to be able to go to heaven one day, but it's an invitation for relationship. To have relationship with the God of this world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. John 3, verse 16 and 17 says, For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, that meaning Jesus, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but they'll have everlasting life. God sent his son, Jesus, into the world not to judge it, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. That's why he sent him. And then Romans 10, 9 says, so how do you become saved? What does it mean? How simple is it? It's not difficult. It's a, just a choice, even if you don't understand it all. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You're not being saved into this church. You're not being saved. You're being saved for relationship, as the Bible outlines, with the God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and his son, Jesus. So I just want to ask a very simple question. If you're here this morning and you've never given your heart to Christ and you want to do that, I'd love to pray with you. As everybody else has their eyes closed and they're praying, just if you would raise your hand quickly, and I'd be happy to pray with you. Okay, secondly, in relation to what I've spoken this morning, look, at, look up at me for a minute if you would. If you have one thing that you can think of that you're grateful for, put up one of your hands. Just one thing. Doesn't matter what it is. You've got something you can thank God for. All right, keep it up, please, if you can. Keep it up. If you have something that you have a need of, whether it's for yourself or you know somebody that you know has a need of, put up your other hand and keep both hands up. See how I, what I did? See how we did that? Now, we are in a posture in a place where we can start receiving something of God from God. Why? Because we start by being thankful and grateful in worship to Him. A. Then, we can transition into, and Lord, 
I have a need. And here is my need. And we can also do what Scripture says in regard to that, which is to come boldly to his throne room in times of need. And he will meet us right where we are. But without that posture of praise, if all we're doing is just coming with needs, that's not a great place to be. Why? Because we need to learn to praise him in any and every situation on this journey.